So my name is David Nekretman, and I know for many of you, this is the first time you're meeting me, and you're going to be meeting Rabbi Pesa Felicki, who's the Associate Director for the Center for Jewish Christian Understanding and Cooperation, and we have the Portnoy Brothers, our Orthodox Jewish worship team, that's going to be leading us in something called Hallel, which is Psalms 113 to 118. Why are we doing this? Is going to be the theme that I'm going to be talking about. The Bible does say, live in Sukkot for seven days. All native-born Israelites are to live in the Sukkot so that your descendants will know that I had the Israelites live in Sukkot when I brought them out from Egypt. I am the Lord, your God. Leviticus chapter 33, verses 42 to 43. But what is a Sukkah? What does it represent at the end of the day? So some of you already know who have been here in the land next to the, uh, the neighborhood, you've already seen people build a sukkah. So that must be the sukkah that the people in the desert who were wandering for 40 years when they came out from Egypt to go to the promised land, that's how it must have looked. And everyone's looking at me, but no, it's not. Because we know from the book of Numbers that Bilam didn't say how wonderful your sukkot are. He said, how wonderful your tents are. Where does this thing, Sukkot, come from? Why are we gathered here today? So there is a tradition that says that the Sukkot represents the divine glory wrapped into the clouds that protected Israel during the 40 years in the desert. Everyone heard about that tradition? If it haven't, this is actually one tradition that we have. The other thing is, no, it actually meant that for 40 years, they were a nomadic tribe. They were going from one place to another place, and they set up tents. But if that's the case, if we look at it as just simply they were, you know, wandering people, so what's this, why are we celebrating? We were Bedouins, in essence. If it's the divine glory, then we can remember that amazing miracle that happened for 40 years. But if it's just simply pitching tents, what's the miracle? So I want to give you an insight from Jeremiah, chapter 2, verse 2. We actually use this liturgical line from the Bible on the Jewish New Year known as Rosh Hashanah. I remember the loving kindness of your youth how as a bride you loved me and followed me through the wilderness, through a land not sown. This is a very rare line in the prophets that actually is praising Israel and not God. Usually in the prophetic literature, you have a lot of things going against the Jewish people. Rarely do you have these lines that actually praise the Jewish people. So there's a famous line, you might have heard of it, how odd of God to choose the Jew. It's a rhyme. And the answer, not quite so odd. The, choo the Jews chose God. It is true that our history has shown that a lot of times we were rebellious. That's for sure. That's on the historical record. That's what I love about the Bible. That is the only historical narrative ready to expose everything about us, the good, bad, and ugly. Because we get an opportunity to learn from the Bible. We don't whitewash our history. But there are times in the history of the Jewish people that we stuck through it. Namely, for the last 2,000 years in exile, we ended up back in the promised land. We chose God. But if we see the sukkah as a temporary home where we were homeless people, then you can understand what it meant for us to spend 2,000 years in exile. We didn't know at the end of the day where we would actually have a permanent home. And in fact, we really never had a permanent home outside of Israel. So this last exile represents what it really meant to set up a temporary home. So I want you to look at the holiday from a different perspective now. Passover represents the 
the love of God to his people. Sukkot represents our love for God. We chose God. And Shavuot, which is known in Pentecost, is the ring, the Sinaitic revelation that binds the relationship between the Jewish people and the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So what we're celebrating is insecurity. Look at it. We're, cel we're going outside of our home to this flappy little hut to celebrate God. And do you know that in our liturgy, we say this is a time of joy. It is cold right now. I don't know if it's very joyous to be outside of the home where you could be a little warm. Especially if you grew up in the United States, which I did, and it could get like zero degrees, depending where you're at at this time of the year. Yet we're outside of the home, and we're, we're supposed to be in a state of joy. That is the actual commandment. I'm supposed to be joyous in insecurity, not having a permanent home. Very interesting as far as looking at the holiday is concerned. And if you actually look at us in living in this land, it also seems to be very temporary at times because we're always in a constant state of war. There's always a threat looming. Yet we're supposed to have joy. So what is joy? In Hebrew, it's called simcha. And simcha is a very special word. Unlike ashray, which is praiseworthy, or happiness, biblical faith never promises you inner peace. It promises you that God will always be there for you. Very important. Simcha is not personal happiness. Simcha, joy, can only happen in a community. You shall be joyous on this holiday. Everyone has to be part of getting together and being joyous. I can't be happy in solitude. The Jewish people is a national narrative. It's not a personal story. In order for us to be truly a kingdom of priests, to, the, to be a light unto the other nations, then we must be a unified whole, but we're working as a community in actualizing it in a land chose by God. If you feel like you need an amen or hallelujah, it's fine. You can do that. Amen. All right. You're all looking at me intensely, and the whole point of this is to be happy. <laughs> Where is he going? <laughs> Happiness is an attitude to life as a whole, while, while joy lives in the moment. Happiness is a state of mind. Joy is taking advantage of a moment. We have something called commandments, but they're really opportunities of sanctification of God. This is how we commune with God. This is not bankrolling our commandments into some HSBC savings account. But every moment is not the same. Every moment is an opportunity to sanctify God. Every moment, truly, to be with God, you must be in a state of happiness. You cannot be depressed and really have that relationship with God in its fullness. You can only appreciate God when you're in a state of joy. But joy does not mean permanent home. Permanency is not joy. Joy is the opportunity of sanctification of every opportunity that God gives us. So what we're doing here today is not a concert. What we're doing here today is coming in, in a moment of joy as a community, as people who believe in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, who actualize their faith in different religious systems, and that's okay. Because as Psalm 117 clearly states, the nations of the world are supposed to be praising God for his unfailing love for the nation of Israel. 
you have come here to be part of the nation of Israel. You have been answering that call where most people say to God to leave a, leave a message after the beep. You are all miracles. Truly miracles, because there are over 2 billion people who identify themselves as Christian. But really, less than a half a percent of Christianity ever make it to this land. Statistically non-relevant, just like the Jews. We're statistically non-relevant in human terms. But when it comes to God's terms, wow, have we made an impact together. Just like the biggest miracle is the state of Israel in our lifetime, that I know that there is a God. Richard Dawkins, the biggest atheist, does not have an answer on the existence of the Jewish people. He must have a lot of faith to have no faith in God. You are in this land. The greatest other miracle at the same time is you coming to this land and standing with the Jewish people. You're on Har Racha harvesting this land as a fulfillment of biblical prophecy. We are all in awe of you. We think this is, some, many Jews think this is a Jewish thing. It's not. This is a God plan thing. We are not worthy of this land. We are promised this land. We have to be rightful stewards of this land. We have a responsibility to make sure covenant is actualized in this land. But if we don't do this alone. The Psalms 113 through 118 clearly sees it as we both doing it together. So these are not songs simply to sing for entertainment. I want to come together in a sanctified moment for God in a state of joy. We brought two outstanding worship leaders here to bring us to that moment of joy together. That's the purpose. Hallel is to praise. If you can't praise if you're depressed. You can't praise if you're sad. It is in that time when you're out here in the elements that you can find the biggest joy. That's the secret to the Jewish people at the end of the day. Even amongst, and you see this in the news, that there could be the worst terror bombings at the end of the day, but come to a Jewish wedding, and it's the joyous occasion of all. And it doesn't mean that every single, every single Israeli, even that Israeli who's not practicing, still has that faith of saying, I am joyous. That's who I am. That's our secret to survival. Because we're celebrating, because God is not in permanency. God is in moving. Time moves. Therefore, we have these opportunities of sanctification. Amen?